1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. It says, do you realize that in a race everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize? So run to win. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with a purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after I would be preaching to others, that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip aside every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Verse 12. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Make out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. These scriptures I present to you today the foundations of my encouragement, my short exhortation today. You guys can take your seats. Thank you. God bless you. I'm not here for long. Time is far spent and I'm only here to give an exhortation and a testimony of the Lord's faithfulness in my life. Last year, uh, May, last year, May, um, or something so casual, I was just playing football. I normally play football every Thursday. And this particular Thursday, I realized that in terms of my health or my fitness, should I say, I felt very unfit in comparison to years past. And growing up, I've always um, involved myself in a lot of physical activities, from football to gym, or just sports in general, keeping myself active. And over the years, probably post-marriage, the challenge of um, marriage is not an excuse I guess because I'm in because I've been in this journey the longest in this house. I was gonna say those that know. Those that know. You guys have been married long enough. You would know that sometimes you can fall off. I remember when we first got married, um there was so much uh stuff left over from the wedding and um you know there was a lot of there was a lot of drinks left, you know. There was a lot of there was a lot of stew left. There was a lot of super malt left, and you know, by the grace of God, I veiled my belly to the workings of you know lovely tasting food. Uh, but when you do so, um, to every action, there's a reaction. Uh, there are consequences for your action. You can enjoy food, but there are consequences if you don't know how to discipline yourself. I very early on in my marriage, entered my T.D. Jake's face where the belly was protruding and it was protruding very strong. And at the time, because, like I said, I've been so used to being fit in my life, you have this image of yourself in your mind. But you know, there's a saying, pictures tell a thousand words. And so one day, me and P.T. were meditating and reflecting on the goodness of God whilst flicking through pictures. And the fear of the Lord fell upon me very quickly. I realized I had lost myself. <laughs> when you're looking at photos and you're like, how can a young man, how can a young, handsome man who's just entered marriage be entering this T.D. Jakes era so early? And the fear of the Lord didn't just fall on me, it fell on P.T. as well. 
Um, and so that began a journey. So we started a fast together, and that fast really worked. It did great wonders. And we kind of journeyed on with that for a little while, and then obviously a few years later, Tehillah comes into the picture. Once again, lost myself again. And by that time, CW had started. So for those of you who don't know, we found out that we were pregnant with Tehillah two days before CW actually started, almost six years ago. And um, at that time, it's just so easy to, to fall out of a routine um, because PT by then was, you know, a lot of tiredness, just stuff around the house. There was a backlog of things around the house. So to be cooking and to be doing all of those things, including myself, it was a big weight trying to juggle so many things. And so you just pick up bad habits. And um, from, from quite young, I didn't really... I'm not too much of a meal person, free square meals. I'm not really into all of that. I was very much used to, you know, secondary school. You have chicken and chips after school and then just sweets and binging off sweets and chocolate. So, um, yeah, I, yeah, kind of fell back into that and fell back into being out of weight. And then a year and a half, two years after Tila was born, we entered a pandemic. The pandemic, wow, that one, if, if it was, if I entered my T.D. Jakes era when we first started marriage, then I don't know what the pandemic was because I really fell off. Um, and that was a mixture of things. It was the pressure of being in a scenario where as it, not just a, a people, but the world at large, we have, we have been, we're in a different space. For someone who s likes being around people, ministers to people every week, uh, to have that removed weighed heavy on me. Um, and I felt very low. Those two, three years, I felt very low. Um, as someone who preaches to people, then to be sitting at home talking to a camera um, impacted me a lot. And I've, I know I've shared it with a few people, but I haven't shared it to the church at last. It weighed heavy on me uh, to do that consistently and repetitively um, for a little while anyway, and then we were allowed one or two people. So I know Timmy for some time. Timmy was coming on Sundays. Nikki was coming on some Sundays as well. Um, and one or two others came um, to, to help us do the live streams. Um, but the journey continued anyway, health-wise. And I'll fast forward it to um, last year. Last year in October, by the grace of God, I was privileged to go to South Africa. And you guys know my journey there. When I came back, when I came back from South, um, actually, I've skipped to keep it. So in May last year, as I've said, May, I realized health-wise, fitness-wise, something wasn't right. So I said, that was on a Thursday. I said, on the Monday, I'm going to go for a 5K run. Um, I'm going to do that to, to help kind of do something different, to push myself out of my comfort zone, but also do something to help build my fitness. That Monday is a Monday I don't think I'll ever forget. I, I said it in my post last week. I, I, I ran 1K. I struggled to run 1K. Um, I, I was breathing bad. My back was hurting, which generally is, a, when you're running, generally is a sign that you're overweight anyway. So it just flagged everything that needed to be flagged in my life. And I want to say this to you. I want to, you know, preface this by saying sometimes we're looking for uh, deep um, encounters with God before we wake up. You know, some of us, we want maybe angelic experiences or encounters or you want to, you know, fall down in your room when you're praying or you want to see an image of Jesus. Sometimes or a lot of the time, the Lord uses the mundane to minister to us. If you would allow him to speak to you, if you, are, uh, you would allow yourself or you would avail yourself to God speaking to you, God speaks the mysterious in the simple. But because we overlook it many times, because we're just like, no, I need something deep before I think it's deep. But a lot of the teachings of Jesus were very simple. The problem is that people were looking for something much deeper, but couldn't follow the simple. Pick up your cross and follow me. One of the greatest commandments Jesus could ever ask someone to do. And yet people couldn't follow him to do the simple things. Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my commands. Jesus Jesus, at that moment in time, people fell off from following Jesus because of the weight of the simplicity. I call it, or someone has coined it, the complex simplicity. In the simple tasks, instructions, 
uh, direction or directives that Jesus gives, you see in the scriptures that people found it hard to follow. And so in this, I realized that God was teaching me something well beyond maybe even a sermon could have taught me. I realized that my life was out of order. I had lost discipline. You see, it's one thing to preach and minister to you guys. But it's one thing when God wants to take an assessment of your life or wants you to take an assessment of your life. He doesn't first jump to your preaching. He first looks to your daily disciplines. What did I ask you to do? What did I, what, what did I ask you to say? How did I ask you to live? Those are the things that he's called us to, 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 to take measure and evaluation of. And so what happened for me was I realized that there's, there's, I, may, I may pay more attention to my spiritual life, but what I, I, I've learned as a believer is very easy to, to uh, deceive ourselves into um, thinking that we are walking with great spirituality when we f super focus on things like prayer, reading the word and stuff like that. Because in the scriptures, we see things like gluttony is a sin. And when you think simple things like not being able to control how you eat and what you eat is also an issue as well. How? Self-control. Self-control is a biblical matter. Many of us overlook it on a day-to-day -day basis, but where we lack self-control, those are the areas that Jesus wishes to speak to. Yeah, I prayed today. Yes, I did that today, but where are you lacking in self-control? Where are you lacking in patience? Where are you lacking in kindness? Where are you lacking in the fruit of the Spirit? Those are the areas Jesus wants you to be healed and formed in and matured in. So anyway, I said, okay, fine, this is a clear sign. And so from that week, I said, okay, you know what? Every week, I'm going to start doing uh, three runs a week um, on the days that I work from home at lunchtime. And two, three weeks in, I could literally do a 5K without stopping. The time wasn't great, but I, at least I could do it. And so as we continued in the journey, I realized that not the, 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 for me, the aim wasn't to get fast. The aim was to complete what I said I wanted to do. And so when I started, I realized that, wow, I'm actually, I'm actually enduring this thing. It's 5K. Some people might not think 5K is long. 5K is about 3 miles, 3.1, 3 miles or something like that. So every, every time I'm doing that, I'm looking back and I'm thinking, a few weeks ago, I couldn't do that before. A few weeks ago, I was stopping, starting, stopping, starting. A few weeks ago, I was holding my back. And we get to... July. We get to July, our anniversary, our church anniversary. I remember before the Lord gave us a word from Isaiah 52, awake, awake, put on your strength, put on your beautiful garments. And yes, it was a word for the house, but it's also a word for every individual. And I think I've said it before here, God, as much as God speaks corporately to a people, God speaks to individual. God says to the house, put on your strength. But what that means is that you as an individual put your, on your strength because we as individuals make the house. So when God is saying to us, when God was saying to us, put on your strength, I didn't know the journey that I was going to go on moving forward because I had just started the running. And as I journeyed on fast forward to October, October was an amazing time. I went to South Africa to do some humanitarian work. By the time I'd come back, start to do my first, I came back on a Thursday, I think. And then I said, okay, I'm going to rest up and then start running again on Monday. I tried to go for just a basic 5K run. Guys, I could not run more than two minutes. I, I, I literally, my, it was literally like someone had padlocked my chest. Maybe with 50 padlocks, I was struggling to, I literally thought I was going to collapse on the road. And so literally, I, I thought, I, me, the per, sort of person I am is, um, <laughs> the way I was raised, and I think I'll probably attribute this to my mom, is that we don't give up where we, we stick to something where, loosely speaking, we're animal-like in nature, where we fight this one through. We're going to have to fight this one through. So I said, these five, I've just come back from South Africa. I don't know what it is, but we're going to have to fight this one through. So I said, even if I walk this 5K, I'm going to walk this 5K. I could, guys, I could not walk that 5K. I had to walk back home because literally I thought I was going to collapse on the road. So I got back home, and that day, after, like, my... Chest got tightened. I started to wheeze. I could not literally, I, even walking up, just lifting one leg. It was like, why am I wheezing? Why, what, what's all of this? And I thought, okay, you know what? 
Maybe take some antihistamine. Maybe I've reacted to something. I'll take that. Nothing was subsiding. I thought, okay, you know what? I'll have some rest. Nothing was subsiding. Later that evening, I was still wheezing. My chest was still tight. And this happened. Then I said, okay, I do three runs a week. Tomorrow, I'm going to do, I'm going to try and run again. The same thing happened. I did it, but this time, even running, I couldn't even run two minutes. This time, it was probably like a minute. Before I got to the top of my road, I, I, I went back home. I said, okay, cool. Then I said, okay, cool. I'm going to give it three days before I do my next one. The same thing happened again. And I think the next week I told PT, I said, Look, babe, something's wrong. This isn't right. Um, I didn't catch a cold out there. I've never had COVID. Um, I don't know what's going on. Something's not right. The next week I tried one run. Then I said, okay, you know what? Yeah, this is off. Let me go um, to get checked out. So I went to, to the GP. They asked what's going on. I said this, that, and the third. They said, okay, all right, we're going to... Um, we're going to get you to see a lung doctor. And remember at this time, what was also interesting is remember at this time, I'd the, we had the car accident as well. So we were out of a car, all of that kind of stuff. Um, the lung doctor couldn't see me till December. So this was literally just before the end of the year. Mind you, I came back from South Africa in October. So the long doctor said, okay, we're going to do some tests, see how it goes, blah, 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 blah. So I'm now doing some tests. And in my mind, obviously, man full of faith, X, Y, Z. He said, oh, you're going to do some few breathing tests. You're going to blow into this thing. You're going to blow into this. Guys, as I was blow, it was as though, look, I can't speak for those who, who, are, who are habitual smokers. But genuinely, I felt like I'd been a smoker all my life. I could not blow in. This thing was, uh, it said, the woman said, blow. Even just inhaling, I felt like I could just pass out. I was like, I felt so ashamed. I was like, and the woman is only there to test me. But in my, she was like, is everything okay? I was like, I can't, I'm struggling to blow into this pipe. She was like, just do the best that you can. And we were doing, I was seeing, I was seeing her face. How, you know when you, you, the doctor is just pulling funny faces, you already know it's long. And their responsibility is not meant, they're not meant to really show a reaction. But by seeing this, Ah, I said, yeah, things are not right. So she was like, yeah, well, she had done a number of tests on different machines. And at the end of it, she was like, um, um, yeah, this is not really good. Um, your lungs are inflamed. There's inflammation in your lungs and there's some, also some other issues. And in my mind, I was thinking, inflammation of lungs, what kind of stuff is this? Um, Pre-South Africa, there was no issues. This had never happened before. I've come back from South Africa, all of this has happened now. So they were now trying to attribute it to maybe South Africa. They were like, oh, did you have malaria? All that, that, that racial, and all those racial undertones in their questions and stuff like that. I said, I was fine in South Africa. Nothing happened. No issues, no problems. Um, and then that was a junior long doctor. Then she said, because um, the, the senior one was away for the Christmas break. And she was like, I'm going to send all these results to the senior one. When you, when you come back, she'll give you like a final analysis. Um, and then... When you know the senior one came back, they were talking about um, something like sports-induced asthma, or athletic-induced asthma, or something like that. Can't remember the name, and also lung inflammation and some other things. And I remember my heart sunk because in my mind I was thinking, what sort of what what is this? I, in life, when it comes to health, I've, I've I don't think I've had a health scare before. But when you're talking about lung inflammation and I was doing, you know, some read-ups about it and stuff like that, I was really concerned because I was like, the impact of this is heavy. Um, I'm like, I still, <laughs> look, I still have a way to go. Um, I still have a family. I still, you know, there's ministry. There's all of those kind of things. Um, and the long and short was after she gave those, whatever, the titles for all those things. I genuinely can't remember. But I remember coming back home so deflated and the reality of it is this, that even though, um, you know, we come up here and we preach and stuff like that, life, when you get news like that, it also hits you hard. Sometimes people think that, oh, just because someone comes up here to preach, it doesn't impact them. It does, um, because you can't just do the basic things. You can't, you know, you're walking and your chest is tight. Literally, I was genuinely, I would wake up in the morning and my chest was tight. That I never, never experienced that in my entire life. 
and now you're coming into you're coming into a season of life where you're waking up you're struggling to breathe you're doing stuff like you're short of breath like gym and all that fitness stuff is out of the, of the way and by the way during those during from october november december january i stopped running altogether so i was not doing any running but what was interesting was we fast forward the doctor said we're going to start some treatment for you uh, to reduce the inflammation all of that kind of stuff and we're gonna we're gonna see what what happens um and that week was interesting because a friend um, that I had connected with maybe two years prior um, had reached out and said, I saw you when you were doing all your runs, your 5K, 10K, 15K, 20K, you know, half marathon stuff. And I was really encouraged by it. I run a charity um, for men's mental health, uh, running and men's mental health. And I, would, I, I think that it would be a good shout for you to run the marathon. And this was coming at a time where I've just had the diagnosis and I thought, God, this, this must be some sort of banter because how can someone who's having lung issues, you're telling them that they're going to be running marathon? So anyway, me, like I said, this is where the mentality things come, come, comes in. Me, if you put me up for a challenge, we're going to go for it. So I said, man of God, yes. Then the next day, um, I said to the doctor, yeah, I'm running the marathon. If you saw that woman's face... Like yeah, there's something you're you're. <laughs> he is not you're insane. You're you've gone somewhere else. You're in a different realm. Like she looked at me like genuinely. I, this is this is not the right thing to do. And I said to her, I said I'm going to do it. She said okay, fine. What we'll do is a month before you do the marathon, you will come back and we'll see how the treatment has been working on you. I said okay, fine. Anyway, let's just start the treatment. So the week after, I said you know what, we're starting the treatment. I'm going to get back on, on the road. I'm going to start running again. The week after, that was the first time in three months that I'd run um, more than a minute. I, I ended up running 45 minutes nonstop. And then I said, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to trust you that you're going to do a work in my life. I'm going, to, I'm going to stick with the treatment and I'm also going to walk by faith knowing that you will work in my body. But all... I'll get to my final point, but during this time, from, from the time I started running, I started to notice that there was a grace for running in the house. So as I started running, others started running. And I, if I remember correctly, Timmy, he's not here today, but I remember when Timmy first wanted to start doing Tougher Mudder, you know, no one was really with him. It was interesting. So God bless Mr. You know, let's go deeper. I think God was using him as a missionary to go ahead of us. But I realized that when I had started, there was a grace in the house to start running. Then I noticed that Rod started running. I think Liz started running. And Sam started running. And everyone started, Mo started running. There was many people. There. Even Prof started running. And I think when they started, everyone started running. I said, okay. No, you was running before. Okay. He was running into the will of God. This one. So people just started running. I said, okay. Lord, you're doing something in the house, and I'm encouraged by it. But what I was encouraged by more was the fact that people were coming to me and asking me for advice, and I am not a pro runner. I am not a pro athlete, but people were asking me about my journey, and I remember, you know, speaking, you know, to Roz a lot, encouraging her, encouraging Mo, encouraging Liz, encouraging Sam, encouraging a lot of you guys about the, the things that have helped me. So one of the things that really helped me whilst I was doing running was listening to prayer and intercession music. And I remember that, I, and this is something that I still do up to this day. The Lord would teach me a lot about life and himself through me running. And so that's something that really helped and sustained me even whilst I was going through the health challenges I was going through. Fast forward, we get to, um, we get to, I've signed up to the marathon now. I've been given a place. And mind you, by the way, the stats for this year's one was that half a million people um, signed up for the ballot. It's a ballot system. So it's like a lottery, a lottery system. So um, five, uh, half a million people signed up. Only 10% of those people were given a space. So 50,000 people were given a space. Um, so I was given a space by the grace of God. So that was even a miracle by itself. And of those 50,000, less than 2% are black people. So does, look, when you see the marathon, it's funny because the people that win the marathon, there are people, right? 
There are people. <laughs> but after that, you don't see our, our, you don't really see our people there. So I was those stats were kind of mind boggling. And also to add to the narrative, guys, I said it in my post last week. Where we come from, we don't do long distance running. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about South London, East London. Where you, yeah, I know for East London, we don't do long distance run. We do sprinting. When you talk to you, 100 meters, 200 meters, we do that. 50 meters, we do that. But marathon, long distance, guys, we don't do that. On top of that, people of my build, we don't do marathon. People of stocky build, that are black men, we don't, we don't do it. So, I, in, in my mind, I always used to ask myself, AP, who sent you? And I'd respond myself, it's the Lord that sent me. So it's the Lord that will carry me through. So I fast forward it to the day before. The day before, so I've been doing my training. Now, the day before, I'd been prepping in my mind, there's certain things I'm going to do as preparation for that week. So I'm not going to go into the office because God forbid I go into the office and I trip up. Or I woke up this day and something bad befalls me. I said, this week I'm not going into the office. Anything that can sidetrack me from get into this marathon, I'm binding it in prayer and I'm binding it with my physical, you know, whatever. I'm not going into the office that week. I'm just going to pick the girls, drop the girls and do food shopping. That's about it that week. But I knew that I had a wedding. A, a good friend of mine was getting married on a Saturday. So I had said to myself, because there's a thing called carb loading that you're meant to do a few days before a race, which just means you need to increase your, your carb, the carbs in your body, which will help you as you're running. And kind of cut down the fibery stuff. So I said, okay, fine, I'm doing all of those kind of things. It is going to be well. But I just, in my mind, I was like, this is a wedding. This is a, and it's a Niger wedding. It's like, well, Nigerian and Ghanaian. I'm like, Lord, I, I love our people's food. But God forbid that I should eat something there that will ruin everything. Ah. That day was that day. So imagine now, I said, okay, cool. They had all, they had jollof rice, they had fried rice, they had, you know, they had, you know, you know, amala, they had all those kind of things. But me, I, I play smart at Niger weddings, you know, African weddings in general. I play smart. I stick to what you know. Somebody say to someone, stick to what you know. So I said to myself, you know what? I'm not going to have the jollof rice and I'm not going to have the fried rice. I will have the plain rice with a little bit of stew. Even the plain rice with a little bit of stew came to minister to my body in a way that was very detrimental. So we came, everything was fine. We, did, we didn't stay at the wedding long. I came home now, two o'clock in the morning. Have you, um, I don't think, and, and none of us have lived in the times of war, but in the times of war, especially like world war, when alarms would go off and everyone would rise up, my body made that alarm. I was sleeping. And in my mind, like, uh, th let me say loosely speaking, you know, some people have, like, imagined what the rapture would be like. Like, if you're asleep and you hear the trumpets go. It was as though I was about to have a spiritual encounter. But I said, this isn't, this isn't the trumpet sounding. This is my stomach. The way I jumped up, I looked at the time. I said, 2 o'clock on the day I'm doing marathon? I said, no, 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 it can't be. Anyway, Sha, that it can't be landed me in the toilet. Guys, that's where I stayed until I left the house early in the morning. Honest to God. Honest, and I was regretting. Sorry if it's TMI. I was sitting on the toilet going, God, but it was only plain rice and a bit of stew. <laughs> ah, how? How? Everything else. I didn't go to work this week. I didn't trip over anything. My body's fine. I've been doing this carb loading thing. Why is it on the day before? Guys, I promise, like, I was so frustrated with myself. And then when it was time to go, so I was meant to leave around 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, as I put on this light jacket to go, as I get to the door to unlock the door, that alarm that my belly was doing sent me back there. I said, this is the last straw. <laughs> By the time I finish, I'm going to make up my mind whether I'm going or not going. That's the honest truth. I just said, I'm going to make up my mind to whether I'm going or not going. Once again, the mentality. I said, you know what? God has brought me this far. I know what I've been through. I know what I've journeyed through to get to this point. Even if I have to, even if I have to drag my own neck to the finishing line, we will get there. So I said, I'm leaving the house. So I left the house, took a bus replacement to Reading. When I got to Reading, did that alarm not go off again? 
me, guys, honestly, I said I'm trying not to do too much TMI, but I'm not explaining more to the story, the gravity of the story. But what I will say is I don't use public toilets, guys. I hate it with my whole soul. I don't even, I don't, even if I go to someone's house, I don't like to, I, there's, there's me, unless there's something wrong with me, I don't use the toilet in people's house. I prefer my own house where there's safety, amen? But this, imagine public, I go in there, I'm just here. I said, Lord, I am, this is not what I'm in for. This is not what I, I've signed up for. I can still go back home. Like literally, there were four, all of them. People were just, I just said, I even feel sick being here, here hearing all of this. That's how, Sha, I said, there's only one, we just load tissue paper, palace. I just loaded that thing with tissue. Every, up, down, on the hand, everywhere. I baptized that place in, t in tissue paper. It's like, and guys, the train I was meant to get on to get me to, to, to the race on time. I looked at the time. I've missed it. <laughs> I said, if, if I look and the next train is not there, I'm definitely not going to be able to make this marathon. So, I've come out now and I've run upstairs and I've asked one of the, the attendants, I said, I'm, I'm running the marathon, he's seen my bib, he's seen everything. He's like, you're trying to get to the marathon, aren't you? I was like, is there a train coming in the next 10, 15 minutes? He was like, yeah, you're very fortunate there's actually a train coming. It wasn't meant to come, but it's coming um, there, whatnot. So I managed to get on it. So I've gotten a coffee now and I said, Lord, this is, I'm get, I've gotten a coffee and I've gotten a croissant. I said, this, this is my holy communion, Lord. I said, this is my communion, Lord. I'm, I have a coffee. Guys, it wasn't cappuccino, all of the, it was just a, it was a flat white. Shout out to the flat white team. I just said it would be a flat white and my croissant. This will be my wine and my communion bread. We'll take this. Lord, you will do your best. So we got on the journey. The journey was fine. So we get to now um, the area where runners are meant to kind of take off their bags, hand it over, get ready and prepared. I said, okay, cool. Let me just go to the, chain, the changing room with like toilets and there's the portable ones. Once again, I hate all those kind of things. I said, if there's anything, I just said, if there's anything in me that needs to come out, you must come out now. Sha? Yeah, anyway. God is good. So I came out and I said, like, yeah, I'm, this is it. Lord, I trust in you. I've taken my Imodium. Imodium doesn't seem to be working. Yeah, we're, we're running this thing and let's go. So I've now dropped everything and we start the run um and the long story short is by the time i just got to after the halfway mark mark that's where you know i bumped into the cw family thank you so much for coming out you guys are amazing <laughs> after that point my stomach started to play up a little bit but also my legs started to cramp and my legs started to cramp oh this is a key testimony two weeks before um Two weeks before the marathon, I had been using, like, like my, my running shoes that I'd been using, I'd been using them for a few years, and you're only meant to use them for like a few hundred runs. After that, you're not really meant to because the soles of it, whatever. So I said to the Lord, Lord, in time for the marathon, I'm, I'm trusting that you would provide. The running shoes that I want to get, running shoes in general are not cheap. So the, one, the ones that I wanted to get are about 300 pounds. So I said, Lord, I don't know how it's going to happen. We've just had Prof's wedding. We've celebrated. We've ministered to the, we've ministered to, to the couple in, in their own special way. I, Lord, you'll have to minister to me. So I remember I just, that, I was just thinking about it and I tweeted. I said, ah, I need new running shoes. That's all I said. Within about 15 minutes, a friend of mine who I do the podcast with, Ore, she DM'd me. No, she texted me to say, bro, what's your shoe size? I said, my shoe size. He said, yeah, I saw your, your tweet about the running. What's your shoe size? I said, oh, it's nine, nine and a half. He said, what running shoes do you use? I said, oh, I use the Nike um, Zoom Alpha Fly 2, blah, de, blah, de, blah. She said, what color do you want? I just put my phone down. Guys, honestly, I wept. Because you don't, <clears throat> you don't understand. I was thinking about the journey. I was thinking about the sacrifice. I was thinking about what is taken to get here. And I was thinking about the fact that it's now two weeks before and I had zeroed in my mind that, you know what, even though I've used these running shoes for a couple hundred times, 
I'm just going to have to run with it. That's how we do. The reality of life is that when we journey with the Lord, there are things that may not come in our time. You still have to keep on going. That's not going to stop you from going. Those, whether, even if I had bust my toe running, I would have still got there in the end. At least I have running shoes. Some don't. Some applied for this thing and didn't make it through. So whether by hook or by crook, we're getting there in the end. But the Lord provided and I wept. She was like, yeah, I'm going to get it. Her husband had, been, had signed a contract with Nike only about three months ago as a Nike professional athlete. Um, some of you might know him as the fastest accountant. The fastest accountant in the UK or whatever. Shat, they went on the Nike portal. They were like, oh, are you sure about this color? Because you might want this, that. I was just thinking, Lord, what kind of favor is this? What did I do to deserve this sort of thing? Shat, they gave me the color that I wore. I didn't see anyone wear that color. You guys know me. We do things differently, you know what I mean? I was running, I was looking at everyone's shoe. I said, no one has this shoe. So I said, we're doing it in style. We're doing it well. But the reality is that th there's, there's kind of a rule of thumb that when you're doing a race or when you're running, you know, about to run a race, always train with stuff that you've had enough time to, to train with. I had not trained with, I had literally, by the time it came, I only had a week left. And I tried to break into it by doing like once, one or two runs that week and some walking, but that was about it. By the time I hit the half, past the halfway mark, my feet started to cramp up. My belly started to do jamboree. That's when it started to, like, literally, my feet cramping started to go into my calves. I was like, Lord, we have over, just under half a marathon to go. I don't know how we're going to do it. And that was the moment where I bumped into the CW family. And I promise you, in those moments, literally, I was kind of like, just before I bumped into them, like, I just, I'd wept a little bit to be like, you know, thank you for bringing me here, but Lord, you know where it is. We've, we've got to end this thing. I don't and the Lord was like, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. Whatever you have to, you will get through it, and I'm going to bring you through. When we say put on your strength. And so seeing these guys, they were cheering me on, and I saw the cards, and I saw put on your strength. I said, yes, thank you, Lord. You know what it was. Because in my mind, I just thought they were going to come and just wave. I didn't know that they were actually going to bring boys in. Hey, AP, hey, go, AP, hey, all. I did not know. So when I saw that, it provided strength. And there was a moment where I was kind of limping, and then I saw Ross going, go on, AP, go on, AP. And I, in, at that moment, I can't lie, my clothes were really cramped. She said, go on, AP. And I remember the first one, I just... <laughs> and then before you know it, I got the ball rolling again. And then I saw them at a second part before, you know, they met me at the end. But the long and short kind of ends where the scripture that I started with, uh, the scriptures that I started with, in that, you know, we've been encouraged to run the race. And this race is not a sprint. The race for eternity is not a sprint. It's not 100 meters. It's not who's the quickest to get there. It's who will end, get there at the end. There are many people, when you look at, when you watch like the Olympics is coming up later on in the year, in a few months time, and you will see that there are people, even professionals who start races but don't end it. There were people that we started, listen guys, there are people that I know that are professional runners who were meant to run the London Marathon. They did not turn up that day. There were colleagues I had at work, I was selling PT. There were two colleagues I had at work that were meant to be at the London Marathon. They had gone to the Brighton Marathon the week before and injured themselves. And they were not there. Me, God had ordained that I would be there. And so for me, the bigger, the, the bigger point to this message is that God who started something is faithful to complete it and you may hobble at some points and you may cramp up at some points but that's not the excuse to exit from the race i saw people collapse i saw people injure themselves whilst we were running i saw people being physically removed from the race and it's that is very much sim symbolic of our journey in this eternal war that when the Lord is holding your hands and when the Lord has given you a word or a promise he will bring you through when, when the word says he will bring you through we begin to paint pictures in our head of how we will look when we come through the reality is that you may come through at the end with some scars and you may come through with your laces undone but the promise is he will bring you through
And that's my challenge to you today, guys. The reality of it is, you know, uh, it says, um, the Apostle Peter said, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. God is faithful concerning his promise. I don't know, I don't know what that health scare was all about. What I can tell you is that the last three months, I've been off that treatment. I've not had to use it. I ran the race. Guys, that tightness of chest did not exist. It's not, in, it's not been exi in existence in my life for the last three months. I was able to, I've been able to go over and beyond. The, the, the lung doctor was even like, you did because the day I was meant to go in, I didn't go for that checkup because I'd forgotten. And so, um, the long doctor was like, oh, what about this? What about this? Just asking questions and was just asking me to do some practical things. And she was like, you know what? I don't think you need to see me until after this thing. Like, there's no need and there's no need to continue with the treatment. In my mind, I was like, I haven't been using this treatment for two months. And I've, the Lord has been doing a work. So the reality is this, guys. Once again, when the Lord says he's going to bring you through, trust he will bring you through how it comes how it's packaged that's not for you to be concerned about because the reality is this the stats say that only 0.1 percent of people on this planet will ever complete a marathon am i not one of them i said to people i said i said since last week when you're talking to you're talking to a marathon runner, you know, you're not just talking to AP. Be very careful. You're talking to I've been, <laughs> but I had, to, but we fought and we laboured for this. And the bigger picture is, God knows I didn't know that Ros and Liz were gonna go, were, were gonna do um, do the half marathon until a short time before. But the reality is this, guys, that sometimes you're going through your own journey thinking, ha, ah, you know, I'm doing this for myself. More time, that's why I read Hebrews 12.1. It says, for the joy that was set before him. You have to think beyond yourself. When the Lord is doing a work in your life, we get so focused on us. The problem is that when Jesus went on the cross, it was a joy for him because he knew that what he was doing was going to impact others. It was more beneficial for others than it was beneficial for him. For the joy that was set before, he endured the cross. I've had to learn to endure my own cross. This was a cross, guys, and it started as something that I thought was trivial. But the Lord was using that to direct me into his will. God knows that I wouldn't have bumped into my bro Joel who said, I think you're ready to do the marathon. Someone at that time when he said it to me, I don't run past 10K. The marathon is 40K plus 42K. So I had not, I, I was nowhere near where I should have been. But the Lord gave me strength from January, February, March. Yes, because it was in April. Three months. No one sensible prepares for a marathon in three months. Guys, the Lord gave me the strength to do so. So with all that said, my encouragement to you guys is that what the Lord has been doing in you, ladies that have run the half, what the Lord has been doing in you is bigger than you. People are watching you. Guys, honestly speaking, the amount of people that have dared me to go, oh, AP, we've been watching you post your journey since you started it. The impact that that's had on my life. Last Sunday, the overwhelming like response. People were talking about inspiration, all of that. In my mind, I'm thinking, when was the last time someone told me that I inspired them? Not that I don't know that I inspire people, but I was so humbled that people said that. Guys, because it goes beyond me. So whatever the Lord has put in your hand, whatever the challenge that the Lord has placed in your hand to do, do it. Do it well. Thank you. Do it well. Endure like a good soldier. Because endurance produces perseverance. We read it on Wednesday's Bible study. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. The world lacks hope. But yet God is raising a people who persevere in order to produce a hope that cannot be given by the world. So if there's anything, guys, remember me on my journey. I'm not a pro athlete. 
I didn't do anything to deserve this. But I stood the process. I endured the challenges. I didn't run for three months, guys. And I ended up training three months that, that led me here. So by the grace of God, we are what we are. And um, next year, I've, I've, I've vowed to God, and I told PT this, next year we'll be back at the London Marathon. You guys are clapping. You haven't heard, you haven't heard the next part. And, and many of you will be joining me. Amen? No, that's, that's where I need your energy to be more. That's where I need your energy to be more. Yeah, so next year, I'm not going by myself. This year, I sowed my life and my legs as a seed. And, and next year, it's going to happen. And you know what? I've already said it. Ross doesn't know, but we're going to speak to, um, what's her name? Sally from, is it Sally? Sophie. Sophie, the center manager for Age UK. Some of you, as, as ministry, we are going to, yes, we are going to sign up. Okay, you've already signed up. We're going to sign up. And some of you will run on behalf of Age UK. Yes, yes. Some of you will run on behalf of Age UK. That's what we are going to do because this is going to be our. This is going to be an act of service to our community. Yeah, we've sang, we've prayed, we've listened to my exhortation and my mini sermon. We're going to serve our community. This is one of the ways that we're going to do so. So the running club is back open. We're going to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we're going to be doing monthly link-ups. Yeah, yeah. Those of you that have been dodging, yeah, fitness, we're taking it serious this year. Amen.